Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a guest interview with Larence Cohen, who's the author of Playful Parenting, The Opposite of Worry, and his newest book, Unplug and Play. We're going to get to all of that in just a second, but before we do, I wanted to share a review of the podcast that came in recently from M. Chakum. And they say, it was wonderful to listen to Sarah connect with her guest and coach about very similar issues I was experiencing with my spirited child. Their honest conversation reminded me about useful, peaceful parenting techniques, such as scaffolding through difficult times and taking time to recharge. I'm so grateful for this podcast. And I am grateful for you community members. And, you know, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do with this podcast was not only to teach people about peaceful parenting and to bring you all of these, you know, wonderful experts that we that we have brought together, but so that you won't feel alone. Because I think that's the hardest thing when we have children who are more or extra and we're working really hard and we look around and we think, you know, why doesn't anybody else seem to be having a, as hard of a time as I am? So, you know, I think that's what M. Chakum was saying in their review. Just it's great to hear about other people experiencing similar things. So to all of you out there, I just want you to know that you're not alone and I see you and, you know, and I know that you are doing such a wonderful job also of supporting each other inside of our community. So that's just really great to see and really makes me happy. And if you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash peaceful parenting. One of the perks you get as a Patreon member supporting the show is access to weekly Q and A's with me and my coaches. So that's really great if you, you know, if you'd like to have a parenting coach in your back pocket, supporting the show through Patreon is a great way to do it. And we really appreciate your, your support because this podcast does take a lot of, uh, you know, I was going to say blood, sweat, and tears, but time, energy, and money to bring to you and to parents like our reviewer so that you won't feel alone and it's so that you'll learn new skills and get new strategies and feel supported along the way. So if you would like to support the show, again, that's p- patreon.com slash peaceful parenting. Okay, let's dive in and talk to our expert today, Lawrence Cohen. And he is, as I mentioned, he is the author of Playful Parenting, which you'll hear me talk to him about. That was one of the first parenting books I read when my oldest son was just a toddler, and it has been hugely, hugely influential on me and my work. I couldn't do my work without the idea of using play as a parenting a parenting tool. He also wrote The Opposite of Worry, and as I mentioned, his new book is called Unplug and Play, The Illustrated Guide to Rough Housing with Your Kids, and that's co-authored with Anthony D. Benaday. I hope I'm saying that right. And Lawrence Cohen is a psychologist, and he he is also a father and a grandfather, and it was just a lot of fun to talk to him and hear some of his great ideas, and I got to ask him some questions that you all ask me about play and roughhousing and some troubleshooting, and it was just a, a great conversation, and he was really generous with his time. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did, and I really, I'm just so happy to bring you such a, you know, I was going to say an icon, it's not exactly the right word, but he's just like a a giant in the, in my world of, of parenting and parenting experts. When I heard that he had said yes to coming on the podcast, I was just so, so excited. So let's dive in and meet Lawrence Cohen. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Great to be with you. Yeah, really nice to be with you too. I my dad gave me your book when my oldest son, who was born in 2001, was a toddler. So I oh. have here a 2001 copy of, oh. of Playful Parenting. Oh. And I just want to fangirl for a minute. I couldn't do the work that I do as a parenting coach 
without your work. And I couldn't have been the parent that I have been without your work. So thank you very much. It was, it's really nice to be able to talk to you 20 years later after having read your book. I appreciate that so much, Sarah. Yeah. And I, I was rereading it yesterday in preparation and I actually hadn't even realized how influential you'd been until I was reading all the things that I, that I do or did and advise my clients to do. And I was like, oh, that's where I got that. <laughs> so really wonderful to have you on the podcast and your work has, has been has been wonderful for me. And I know it's it's been great for a lot of people. So thank you so much for coming on. I was really excited when you said yes. I was like, we were driving and I checked my email and I was like, Larry Cohen said yes to the podcast. <laughs> so, so tell us, tell our listeners about who you are and what you do. And I hear that you have a new book coming out. Sure. Well, my name is Lawrence Cohen. I'm a psychologist. In the last 30 years or so, I've been focused on parenting and child development and play. And that switch started when I wrote Playful Parenting. And then I followed that up with The Opposite of Worry, which is a book about children's anxieties and also parents' anxieties. I heard from a lot of parents that, oh, I wish my parents had had this book when I was little. And uh, I agree. That's part of why I wrote it, because I wish my parents had had it when I was little. And then The Art of Rough Housing. And actually, the brand new book is a reboot of The Art of Rough Housing, and it's called Unplug and Play, The Ultimate Illustrated Guide to Rough Housing with Your Kids. That's awesome, because so many parents have no idea what to do when I tell them to do rough housing. It's one of my big prescriptions for parents, And but what do we do? And so that's so great to have that as a resource. Yeah, so this book, it's it's if you hate it or you're scared of it, this, I hope, will let you know that it's, it's sound, it's good, it's safe, with a few simple things to make it safe. And if you love it and you need more ideas, then it's chock full of ideas. So really, I agree with you that rough housing is a great prescription for families. You know, 10 minutes of rough housing before homework time can totally transform things. Or yeah, I, esp I especially prescribe it as after school activities to reconnect, release some of those feelings from the emotional backpack after a long day at school, and also before bedtime, which a lot of parents are really resistant to because they think it's going to get kids all wound up. What do you say to that? Well, I'd say know your kid. My daughter, when she was young, she could roughhouse up till the second she put her head on the pillow and then she'd be out. Other kids need some more time to wind down. So experiment, but don't not do it just because you think it'll wind them up, but experiment. And then if it seems to be escalating too much, it's often because you don't give it enough time. So I said 10 minutes, but, you know, for some kids, they're just warming up after 10 minutes and they really need more time. So instead of not doing it, figure out how to do it for longer it can make it just an enormous difference in the family. Yeah, I love that. How did you become a playful parent? Well, I was an anxious kid. I was an anxious young adult. I was an anxious dad. And I wasn't that playful. And I really had to work at it. And so I can totally relate when people say, what are you talking about? You know, or one mom said, you lost me at get off the couch. So I really, it was partly a decision to, to get off the couch, to connect. And the decision, I made the decision because I could see that connection was primary and the heart of everything. And how do you connect with a child it's not the way we connect with a grown up friend. It's just different. And I couldn't make my daughter connect my way. You know, here she's a baby and a toddler and a preschooler. She's not going to do the things that I would think of as how I would connect and engage. I had to go join her in her world. And fortunately, when I started, it was so rewarding. It was rewarding because of her smiles and giggles and laughs. It was rewarding because of the connection it built between us. And it was rewarding because it just felt good. And so I didn't have to force myself after that. I had to push myself pretty hard to start. I had to push myself to be undignified because as an anxious person, it's like, I want everybody to always think that I'm in control and I'm a, in, you know, and have it all together. And so to fall over and make silly noises and wear funny hats and 
be goofy and silly and to let my child be the strong one to do that role reversal. I remember doing this the first time was in a baby swing. We were at the playground and there's the, you know, the swing for toddlers where they're strapped in and she was swinging and her feet came right near my chest as she was swinging. And I, ah, and I pretended that she had knocked me over and I was falling over backwards and she laughed harder than she had ever laughed before. And I thought, this is good. This has got to be something good. And then I saw her years later, I saw her doing this with a little boy and she was swinging this little boy in the neighborhood and she fell over backwards and got him to laugh. And I thought, this is really, this is so sweet and so beautiful that she learned that if you're bigger, you don't have to overpower anyone. You can reverse that roles in play, let the younger person be confident and it, you get the laughter, you get the confidence, you get the connection. It's just the whole package. Okay. A couple things I want to break down about what you said. What do you have, you know, you said it was hard for you to get started and that once you did, you know, the reward was great, but do you have any, any advice for parents that really are resistant to getting started other than just do it like some easy ways in? Sure. One thing is to set a timer there's probably nothing you couldn't do for 10 minutes. That's what I say. <laughs> so you can do you anything do it for 10, 10 minutes. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So. Including play American Girl doll sleepovers, which was the thing my daughter always wanted uh, to play. Well, for me, it was Ariel the Little Mermaid. And I hated it. It was so boring. And I discovered something amazing, which is that this game, Ariel the Little Mermaid, was so boring. And she would take the clothes off the dolls and put new clothes on and have a wedding. And it was just repeated over and over and really boring and really sexist. And really, and I would try giving her lectures and I would try begging her to do something different. But nothing changed until I decided I'm going to play this game for 10 minutes with extra enthusiasm. Now, how I got to the point of being able to do that was I called a friend when Emma was not listening and I had a little temper tantrum about this. I was like, I hate this game. I'm going to run over the dolls with the car. I'm going to tell her you can't buy them anywhere anymore. And, and my friend said, oh, do you feel better after your temper tantrum? And I said, I'm not having a temper tantrum. I was like, oh, you know, I do feel better after my temper tantrum. <laughs> so that was a huge discovery to me that I could unload my feelings with a friend. I didn't have to bury them inside or dump them on my daughter. I could be true to those feelings in a place where it was safe with my friend. And after that, I just immediately had the thought, I can play Ariel the Little Mermaid or American Girl Doll. You know, you can play all those things. American Girl Doll Sleepover. I could do all those things. Could play, you know, shoot 'em up games, you know, and anything that I formerly hated, I can do that enthusiastically for 10 minutes. And my daughter was suspicious at first. You know, I said, oh, let's play Ariel the Little Mermaid. She said, really? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, the game was really creative. And I thought, oh, there's nothing wrong with my daughter. I kind of thought there was something wrong with her. She had this boring game. She had no creativity. She had no interest in being active. But it was me. All that ugh, was coming from me. And so as soon as I was enthusiastic the game transformed and we were having rock concerts and we were running around and not just standing there with, with the little dolls and the timer went off and I didn't want to stop. And I couldn't believe it. This is really a miracle. So one thing you talk a lot about in your work is following their lead, which is what you did. Like, instead of just like, like you were, you found the enthusiasm and you did what she wanted to do. Cause a lot of parents that I work with, they might say, well, I don't mind playing with my kid, but I don't want to play that game or, you know, I'll, I'll read them books or we can do Play-Doh or something like that. But, but can you speak a little bit? I mean, what we call in a peaceful parenting is join the child in, in their world. I think you said, maybe I got that from you. <laughs> I don't know anymore where I <laughs> got and everything. But can you speak a little bit to why that's important, not just to play that, you know, that adult's idea of how the game should go or to, to guide the game, let the child right. guide it? It's great to introduce your child to the things you love and to let your love carry over and maybe they'll love it if you're lucky. And that's great. And with my granddaughter, that's happened with cooking. I love cooking with her. And But 
you can't force it. You know, I just didn't force it. I was just be, I'm cooking. And, and then she's like, oh, can I help? And absolutely. And now it's something that we really enjoy doing together. But, but like you said, more, the, more often than, than trying to get them to love the things you love, you just, when it's playtime, you put that aside and you join them in what they want to do. Let play be their world where they're in charge. We have, we have to push them into so many adult things, schedules, places where you have to be quiet, places where you have to have clothes on, places where you can't touch anybody, and, and all these requirements. And our children, for the most part, are, you know, they cooperate with these. You know, what choice do they have? But they're more cooperative and more easily ready to do these things if we balance it sometimes and we join them in their world. And some parents, of course, go too far. And it's like, oh, yeah, the child's in charge of meals and bedtime and whether they go to school or not, or, you know, absolutely every decision in the family and who, you know, we, and I, you know, I, we get there sometimes with our granddaughter. It's like, oh, so she's deciding who gets to sit where. You're allowed to do table. that with your granddaughter though. Sure. <laughs> sure. But in between is that sweet spot where in play we join them. And sure. There's other things that are adult decisions and let those be adult decisions. And we do this with as much input and consultation and understanding as we can, but play, join them, and the big payoff is the connection that you get, the boost in connection when we join them in their world. And even for older kids, I was thinking about my my middle son is almost 19, and when he was like 12 or 13, he was really into snowboarding. And one day he said, mama, come and watch these snowboarding videos with me. And I was, I was, did not, wasn't interested in snowboarding. I had other things to do, but I said, okay. And I went and sat next to him on the couch and watched these snowboarding videos. He ended up, Larry snuggled up to me, this big 13 year old, like snuggled up to me watching these snowboarding videos never would have happened if I hadn't gone into his world and agreed to watch these snowboarding videos with him. Exactly. And you didn't do it because you love snowboarding. You did it because you love him. And that's the point. And when we love someone, we, we join them and we don't have to love the same activity, but we love being with them and supporting their love for it. Yeah. And if it's, if it's hard, I always say like, use it as a mindfulness activity and just keep drawing your attention back to your child and that you're doing this because you love them and you want to show them that you love them. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And if it keeps being hard, then go back to that earlier thing that I said, which is find a friend who you can call before or after and unload all that and just, you know, Hey, can I just talk out loud for a minute? Because I'm about to go do something that is going to be very hard. And I just want to tell you, ah, I don't want to, because I don't want to say that to my kid. And your friend will laugh and say, sure. And, you know, you can kind of exaggerate it and ham it up. And that to me made the biggest, biggest difference being able to do that. That's a great thought. And the other thing you talked about was the role reversal. And one thing I, I know I learned from you that I suggest all the time is that power in that power imbalance, you know, kids often experience life as feeling powerless and they don't get to decide what they eat or when, if they go to school and, you know, so many things are decided for them. And I always think that play is such a great, a great time for them to be powerful. So can you, and can you talk about that? And also I've had some coaching clients who, especially the dads are resistant to the idea of the child being the powerful one in play. So, so can you address that two part idea? Sure. I've been thinking of it in terms of personal agency. And personal agency is a sense of, I know who I am. I know what I can do. I can get my needs met. I can make things happen. And we want this for our children. We want them to be independent. We want them to advocate for themselves. We want them to be resistant to negative peer pressure. We want them to figure out that they want and go for it. But we do a lot of things that undermine personal agency. And we don't mean to, but we do. And we tell them, you're, you're cold you're hungry, you're full, 
you're not scared, you can't do that, that won't work. And when I started making that list, I was like, oh gosh, oh gosh, oh gosh, I've said all these things so many times. And I never really realized that I was undermining personal agency. And so two big ways to support and promote personal agency, one of them is giving children that autonomy, that they know if they're cold or hot, they know if they're hungry or full, with me and my wife, I don't know when I'm full, so I just keep eating. She doesn't know when she's hungry, so she just forgets to eat until she's cranky. And so between us, it's like, whoa, how did this happen? Like somebody, something, things happened that overrode my awareness of fullness and overrode her when I was a child. Yeah. And overrode her awareness of being hungry, you know? And so we have to, as adults now, do it the harder way, which is how do I recover and create that sense of personal autonomy and to know when I'm hungry and know when I'm full and know when I'm cold and, and then know what I want to do with my life and know what I, what I want to do if I have an hour of free time and you know that all that is so important. So that's one way is to give children that autonomy, not give it to them, allow it, you know, not take it away from them. And the second thing is to use play to build that sense of personal agency a great place to do it you're not going to put them in control of your family finances but they can be in charge of how high they climb and they can be which was a hard one for me because i was just be careful be careful you know and and i had a friend who said to me you know larry she's going to be uh, recover better from a broken arm than from being timid and fearful her whole life which i just totally took to heart it really knocked me over there's That's research so about that too. True. I don't know if you've seen, there's research about kids who get an injury or I, I don't know exactly what it is, but that, that they actually have better senses of safety as, as they're older. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So risk, self-determination of risk is a big part of developing that personal agency. So it's not go do it. Everybody else is doing it. Don't be a baby. And it's not, oh, be careful, be careful. Don't do that. You can't. It's, I trust you to know how far you can go, how high you can climb. And another part of this personal agency is feeling powerful. And like you said, in play is a safe place to feel powerful. So if you had a shot at the doctor, you come home, you want to play doctor, and you want to be the one giving the shot this time. Children do this spontaneously. They bring something painful or interesting or confusing into their play and they master it. And I think that if somebody says, oh, no, no, a child can't feel powerful, that's not their place. Well, I would change the question a little bit and say, do you want your child to feel a sense of mastery? Do you want them to face a problem and say, I can handle this? Or do you want them to face a problem and say, oh, I can't do it. I need my daddy to do it for me. He's the powerful one. I'm just a little helpless weakling. Well, I think most people would say, oh, no, that's not what I want to aim for. I want my child to be powerful. And except we get a little confused because it's like, I don't want them to be, pow be powerful with me. You know, I don't want them to speak up about against me. I want them to say no to their peers who want to smoke cigarettes, but I don't want them to say no to me about it's time for bed. So it does get a little complicated. But Winning, letting children win at games. So, you know, wrestling and, and uh, you can't ever knock me over. Ah, you got me. This builds so much confidence and I've never seen it confuse a child. Because they know. They know it's play and they know more about play than we do. You know, there was research that children know if play fighting is healthy, good roughhousing or if it's bullying and somebody hurting somebody else. Adults are not very good at knowing. Adults either say, oh, they're just being kids, they're fine, when actually it might, somebody's really getting hurt and being bullied. And parent and adults also say, oh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, that's fighting, stop fighting, we're not gonna allow that, when actually it was healthy play fighting. So children know about that, they know about play, they know about power. Now they might say, I'm stronger than my daddy, but so what? Now, they know that that's not true. And they, they need that burst of confidence. 
a lot of people are afraid that then they'll go out with their peers, their peers are not going to let them win, and they'll be at a disadvantage. I don't see that at all. The kids who are at an advantage out in the world are the ones who've had that chance to build up their confidence inside. They've won at home. They've had a place where they can just be king of the castle. And then they go out and it's, whoa, it's not like that out here. But I have an inner strength that I've developed. So it just it develops an inner strength that develops a persistence. And if you add the, if you add like when the parent, you know, loses in the fight and then the kids laughing at the parent losing, then they're also like working through their own complicated feelings about when they're powerless, right? Exactly. And there's a, there's a concept that I call the knot of tension. And I think it's so important and so valuable that children develop a knot of tension about all kinds of things. It might be about winning or losing. It might be about being teased, feeling small. Like you were saying, there's knots of tension around homework and around chores and around, you know, bedtime and around, you know, all the things that we have tension about. And so, of course, the relationship will have tension about. Well, if you have tension about feeling small and you've been teased at school and you have to get rid of that tension. And so if you conquer your parents in wrestling and you say, ha, 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 ha. Well, you're not being mean. You're releasing that tension, the role reversal, the confidence, the joy of victory lets you loosen that knot, release that tension. And now you can be more confident in the world. You can be more confident with your peers. You're less likely to get picked on because you walk through the world more confidently. And It's because you had that chance to win at home, because you had that chance to laugh. When parents get bent out of shape because, oh, my child thinks he's going to knock me over and then laughs and he thinks it's funny when I fell over. Well, that just means we have work to do. They're not of tension. The ways we get got triggered when we were, you know, from when we were kids, because all of us felt small and helpless when we were little. And now that we're big, it's our job not to, now suddenly lord it over everybody but it's our job to just relax and to let kids feel calm that leads to another question that i wanted to ask you about a a concern that parents sometimes have that if you respond playfully and and i know this is something that you recommend like when a kid is being kind of challenging to i mean maybe i should just ask you to explain it rather than try (laughs) to explain it to you but but the fear that if you respond to unsavory behavior with playfulness it's going to teach children not to respect you. So maybe you could give an example of of like an unsavory behavior, like, you know, I hate you or, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. And how you could respond playfully and then address the fears that if you, if you respond playfully, somehow it teaches kids that it's okay. Exactly. And there's a related fear, which is if I give you a hug, because I know that you've acted poorly because you're hurting inside that somehow that hug is a reward for the bad behavior. And I think that these are two misconceptions that we have to correct. That idea that playfulness lets you know it's okay and the hug is a reward. And the truth is that if we understand what a child was trying to do and what was motivating them and we meet them there, then the result is going to be good. Then it's not going to be a problem. So a child is being too aggressive and, and or they're doing something, they're not cooperating. And we say, you know, things have been really tough lately. We haven't had much connection. I think, I think you could use a hug. I know I could use a hug. And we give that hug and they relax. Well, this is not a reward. Our children are not pigeons or rats. All that stuff about rewards and punishment came from research on pigeons and rats. Our children are human beings with a fine, really complicated brain. And what happens is they get that hug, they relax because the need has been met. The emotion has been met. And therefore, they don't have that drive to hit or break things or not cooperate or all that stuff, all that troubling behavior. It's the drive is gone and we have not rewarded bad behavior, we've met the source 
and we've reached the source and we've met the need, we've had the empathy for the feeling, we've made physical contact, warm, close physical contact, and, and now things are back on track. The same with play. When older siblings have a new baby and they're aggressive with the baby, I always introduce a game called Oops, I Dropped the Baby. And with a doll, not with a real baby. And I don't know if the baby watches this, understands this game, but I try to make do it do it without the baby around, just in case the baby's like, I don't know if I like this game. But the toddler or the three-year-old or four-year-old, or it can be the you know seven and ten-year-old, you know. So it's like, oh, I've got this sweet baby, and I'm holding a doll. It's like, oops, I dropped the baby, and and it's a rescue and destroy, rescue and destroy, rescue and destroy this baby. And there's so much laughter. And I've never seen a child say, oh, that's a good thing to do to the real baby. It's always the playfulness has reached the deep feeling and the deep need underneath and has resolved it. And so the aggression towards the baby is because the child doesn't know what to do with the jealous feelings and the angry feelings and the betrayed and abandoned feelings. They're too strong. We tell children, use your words, but adults aren't able to use words about these things like rejection and abandonment. I mean, how many adults are good at that? And children, certainly their language abilities are so new, they, they can't use their words to talk about something so big. And so instead of use your words, I would say, use your play. And, and in play, you play, drop the baby, or you play, oh, you can pick on a little tiny baby, but you better not pick on me. You better not try to tackle me. You better not pinch me. You bring it on and you make it playful. Now what's happened is all those deep feelings have a place to flow to completion. Okay? When, we, when we, the ch older child pinches the baby because they're jealous, that doesn't complete the feeling. In fact, they get yelled at or smacked or sent to their room for pinching the baby, now they've got new, hard, difficult feelings on top of the original jealous feelings, piles and piles and piles of feelings. There's no flow to completion. We want behavior to stop. And that gets in our way of seeing that, yes, the behavior needs to stop, but what really needs to happen is for the feeling to flow to completion. I don't know anything better than playfulness or warmth and hugs and cuddles and empathy to help feelings flow to completion. And when the feelings are flowed to completion and the underlying needs are met, then you just don't have the problem behaviors that we think require punishment. Yeah. And I think there's like an underlying belief that parents have to come to that their children are fundamentally good and that they want to be good. And it's not that their, their like natural state is to be bad and doing, you know, quote, bad and doing bad things. Cause that's where that rewarding bad behavior comes from. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's just, this is a good child. I, I heard it said very well by uh, Dr. Becky recently. I'm sure you're familiar with and Listeners are familiar with Becky Kennedy, but she said that the, the the question is not, what's wrong with my child? Why would they do that? The question is, that's so interesting. Why would a good child do that? And that leads you to somewhere much more valuable, which is, what are they hurting inside? Did something happen? Are they confused? What do they need? And also about ourselves as parents, it's not what's wrong with me and I'm a terrible parent and I'm no good. It's why would a good parent do that? And that's a fascinating question. You know? Why would a good parent yell at a kid? Why would a good parent hit a kid? Well, could it be that they got so overwhelmed with frustration and so triggered and so overloaded with emotions and they were not given growing up good resources and skills for handling such overloaded emotion that they were just up against the wall. And yeah, so then the question is, how do I get enough support, get more support so I'm not up against the wall like that? Yes, increase your resources, but also that self-compassion piece that you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And compassion for our kids that they're, you know, <laughs> they're trying to get their needs met and they don't know how. Yeah. 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 So, so one thing that I know you write about and I've heard you talk about is responding to aggression with playfulness. And that's another one that's hard for parents to, to do. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some strategies that people can use? Sure. When it comes to this, timing is everything. So there are times when the feeling, that if it's an angry feeling, for example, is so intense that we can't go directly to play. So, you know, uh, I had this game that I wrote about called the love gun, which is this boy aimed a squirt gun at me. And I said, oh, you found the love gun. And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, when I get shot with that gun, I have to love the person up. So it transformed this aggressive, aggressive play, which is fine. I could have just said, oh, no, you got me. Ah, you know, I could have done that. But I, but I added this layer of the love gun to it. Well, the mom said, I tried that and it didn't work. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, my son kicked me. He was really angry and he kicked me. And I said, oh, that was a love kick. Now I have to love you. And it made him even madder. And, you know, and, and I said, well, yes, I understand. And I, it was a good idea. But the problem is he was too angry. The emotion was too hot to go right to play. And so sometimes we need to go right to the emotion and forget about play for that moment and to say, boy, you're mad. You're so mad you kicked me. Well, I would say you're so mad you felt like kicking and then you did kick. And boy, that was really mad. That's a strong, strong way to say I, that you're mad and that really hurt. And let's just take a big breath and take a step back and and, uh, you know, and you, you focus on the anger and you're genuine about, I, I didn't like it, that hurt, but you focus on the deep emotion. But sometimes it's not so intense and the child's being aggressive and you can say, well, what you want to do is shift it from real violence to symbolic aggression. So the little boy with the love gun, he was already doing symbolic aggression. I really didn't need to do anything different. I could have just kept going with that game. But if he had, was going to actually hurt someone and I catch him before it happens, then I can say, hold on a minute, you know, let's go pound some pillows together, which is symbolic aggression. Symbolic aggression is only healthy if there's a connection, if you're kind of doing it together. So if you go in your room and smash things and then you don't feel better. You're too isolated. You're not actually releasing the feelings behind it. But let's go pound pillows together, or I'll hold a big sofa cushion and you punch it, and I'll say, oh, ow, ooh, ow, 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 ooh, ow, ow. Well, then you have symbolic aggression, you have connection. And when you have those two things, then you have healthy growth. And what the child learns is aggressive impulses are normal. I can learn to channel them constructively playfully. And, and this is what we want. If we try to say aggressive impulses are bad and you have to stop having aggressive impulses, then forget it. Every human being has aggressive impulses and has always had aggressive impulses. So it's about, it's about helping the child channel those? Yes, to channel it, to recognize that it's normal and it, it, that it can be normal, it can be safe. And we can make it safe. So, so there was a family who had an aggressive child. He would have explosive tantrums and would become really rageful and violent. And they introduced this game, which I love. And I write about it in the Unplug and Play book. It's called Force Field Hands. And it starts where you have your hands out and the other child and the child has their hands out almost touching yours. So your two hands meet their two hands and you start out almost touching and you feel like a force field between you. And then you go to touching and pushing. And pushing is different than punching. And so what this mom did with her son is this young teenage boy who was getting very aggressive, started when he was not aggressive, started it just at a calm time. Let's do some pressing, let's practice this. And then we can use it when things get heated. 
And he would push and push against her hands. She would put resistance to match the resistance he was pushing. She would push back. And then slowly, slowly, he would push her back and out of the room and out of the room. And, and finally, she'd fall back onto the bed, like two rooms away. And he would jump up on top of her and they would have a more friendly wrestle. Well, then she started saying, let's do push hands when he would start to be getting towards the explosive level. And sometimes, it, you know, he couldn't change gears fast enough and sometimes he could. But they brought in this pushing game, which you call it a game that makes it symbolic. It's pushing instead of punching that makes it playful. And she's saying, Yo, you can't get me. You're not strong enough to get me. And that adds another layer of, of play, like a container over these big feelings. And then soon he started asking for it. So he would catch himself. She, sometimes she wouldn't even notice. The mom wouldn't even notice that he was starting to lose his temper. He became more aware of his own inner workings of his feelings. And he'd say, I think we need to do pushing hands. That's so cool. She would say, absolutely. Because, wow, what an incredible development of self-awareness. That's great. It's two, an, another related question about aggression. I have had some parents report to me that rough housing starts out fun and light and joyful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then their kid somehow goes over the falls and gets actually angry and aggressive. And so they stopped rough housing because it always ended in somebody getting hurt. What what would you what advice would you give them? Well, there's a couple things. One is if if somebody cries, that's not necessarily the end of the world. So there's a difference between you know if the series of injuries are happening all the time, then we got to do something different. But if somebody ends up crying and you comfort them, then then what that might mean is that the closeness and fun and joy of play open the door to buried feelings. There's a trap door with buried feelings. And when there's a party going on upstairs, it's like, hey, let me out. And the big feelings can come out. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Parents are afraid of it and don't like it, but it's a good thing. So sometimes it's just, yeah, if this always ends in tears, then maybe that's great. Maybe those are tears that needed to come out. But if it ends in, in injury, if it ends in things breaking, if it ends in totally that out of control escalation, then there's a few things you can do. And one of them is pause, restart, pause, restart, pause, restart. Instead of zoom, 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 escalate, escalate, escalate. So you can pause, restart by having one minute rounds. So if you're wrestling, kids are wrestling each other or you're wrestling with your kids, you have 30 second rounds or one minute rounds and then ding, 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 Separate corners, okay, now go. With a pillow fight or dance party, you say freeze, and you and then the freeze is very short, half a second long. Freeze, okay, go. That's how short the freeze is. And because you want the freeze to be successful. You don't make the child freeze, but you just freeze yourself in a funny statue position, and then okay, go. Or hold the child with your arms around them, but for a quarter of a second, so they don't feel trapped and constrained. It's just freeze, okay, go. And the freeze, okay, go is frequent and very short. And this lets the energy rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall. That's a big help to keeping that rough housing energy from escalating out of control. Yeah, is that and so I I guess that's because the kid can maintain a level of regulation because of the pauses in the play. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, cuz the the family I'm thinking of specifically, it would always end up it would always end up with the mom getting headbutted or something like that. Like the kid would just get completely dysregulated. Exactly. Really and the helpful. child's excited and then, you know, and then it's important to catch it and redirect b before that happens cuz otherwise the kid's in trouble for being excited and that's their experience. Their, their experience is not, oh, headbutting is bad. I'm going to not do that. Right. Their, their experience is excitement is bad, but how do you stop being excited when you're excited? This is exciting. So, so yeah, so rise and fall, rise and fall. Another thing is 
to push with everybody holding a cushion that's big enough that you need two hands to hold it and big enough that you can't headbutt over it in this case. So you're each holding a big cushion and you're punching, pushing against each other and you get that tactile feedback from my cushion pushing against your, your cushion. And it's a lot safer because you can't punch, you can't headbutt. Then another option is, oh, headbutting, that is exciting. The only problem with headbutting is it hurts me. And so I'm going to hold a big sofa cushion in front of me and you come running as fast as you can from the other side of the room and bash your head right into it. And then you don't get a concussion. I don't get a concussion. I don't get a headache. I don't need to say, we got to stop roughhousing. It always ends in disaster. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, one final troubleshooting and then I'll let you go. When you've touched on this before, but I wonder if you have anything to add. When kids have a hard time stopping, one thing you said earlier is to make the longer, make the sessions longer. Are there any other tips that um, Oh, absolutely. I have a great trick for you. (laughs) I don't usually like tricks, but this is one that I like. Let's say you have 30 minutes dedicated to play. And let's say your child always has a big upset when it's time to stop. And then it makes you not feel like playing because it just, it always ends so badly. And then it ruins, you know, it feels like it, it has erased all the joy and connection you built during the play and all that. So you've budgeted 30 minutes. After 15 minutes, you say, time to stop. And then they say, no, it's not fair. And you never play with me and one more time. And, and you have a totally different attitude than you've been before because you still got 15 minutes in your budget. You're not over budget. Normally, you have 30 minutes budgeted. It's, you stop at 30 and then one more. And then it's like, okay. And then, oh, one more. And okay. Now you're over budget and now you're angry. Well, this way, you're still under budget. And if they want to spend the next 15 minutes arguing with you and whining and moaning and you're so terrible, well, for some reason, this is what they've chosen to do instead of playing for the second half of their playtime. And you're fine with it. Do you go back and like if they say, oh, no more after 15, do you say, okay, let's play more? Or do you actually stop playing at the end of the 15 minutes? If they say, okay, then you say high five. And, and you think, next time, maybe I'll do this at 25 minutes into it instead of 30. Because maybe things are shifting. Maybe, maybe what's happened in that case is the way I said time to stop was different. And I didn't even notice. But my child noticed because instead of the, oh, God, oh look at the time, it's, we have to stop. And, or, oh, time to stop because I know I've got 15 minutes. I've got an extra 15 minutes hidden here, packed into the budget, padded budget here. And so I've said, oh, time to stop differently. I've said it so lightly that they don't get triggered. And they're not feeling abandoned and bereft. And so, yeah, so it might be that they take it fine because you've said it differently, in which case it's like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll see if I can take note of that. that. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And also, as you said, in the other example, maybe they're, you know, the crying at the end isn't such a bad thing because they're emptying their emotional backpack. Exactly. Exactly. So, but if that happens routinely, instead of being upset about it and mad about it, budget in the time. So first shift is, oh, so these tears at the end are a good thing because the closeness and joy and connection open the door and lets this old stale air out. Now we just need a matter of time for it. So now we say, okay, so 30 minutes of play, let's say 20 minutes to play, 10 minutes to cry because it's over. Great. And we don't have to be judgmental about it. You know, I mean, we can't not be judgmental. We have judgment, but we can just check ourselves and say, you know, who am I to say, that 20 minutes of play and 10 minutes of crying is worse than 30 minutes of playing. You know, it's yeah. not up it's to what me. they need. It's what yeah. they need. What yeah. We give them what they need. And now I wouldn't say that to the child. I wouldn't say, okay, you're going to get 20 minutes to play and 10 minutes to cry. Because this just feels, yeah, it just kind of hurts their feelings. There's no need to, to say that out loud to them. We just know it in ourselves. All right. I know I said only one more thing, but really this is the last thing. Before the, the, my final question, I ask all my guests, 
I, this is something that I think you're famous for, which is your response to swearing. Can you give us a, you, you really, I think you are famous for this. And every time <laughs> I suggest it, I always say, just like Lawrence Cohen says, this is what we should say. So can you give us a little, when your kid swears, drops the F-bomb or whatever? Through our swear words or bathroom words, all that stuff. First, we see it as a developmental advance. Instead of being all bent out of shape, we recognize that children have learned language and now they've learned one of the amazing features of language, which is some words have special power, right? They have the power to make people laugh. They have the power to make people turn red and blessed. They have the power to make people angry. Words have power and power is fascinating to children. And words are fascinating to children. All words have power, right? Because we know once a toddler can say more instead of screaming, that's an incredible power that they have. And it's a wonderful advance. So they figured out, oh, these words have power. The second thing to remember is that we taught them new words. We didn't mean to teach them. We didn't sit them down and teach them. I had a friend who said, I don't know why my daughter says this, you know, F word all the time. And I said, you don't? Because this friend of mine said it all the time. And I said, well, you say it all the time. And, I, and he says, not to her. Like, oh, so she's deaf when you're not talking right to her. In fact, it's the opposite. You know, children tune us out when we're talking to them. So with those two things in the background, then we can play a game about it. And the game is, oh, that word, that word's fine. But you better not say quagmire or any word that comes to your mind. Probably a word that doesn't come up in normal conversation. That's I don't know why I always use quagmire. Don't say quagmire. They say quagmire, quagmire. And you say, ah, oh, I can't believe you're saying that. It's so terrible. Ah. So they're getting all of the benefit of using a powerful word. And now it's playful. It's the same as we talked about real aggression and symbolic aggression. So this is a really a word that, that sets people off or symbolically saying a word that playfully, symbolically sets people off. If that gets boring about quagmire, then it's like, oh, good thing I didn't tell you the really bad word. What is it? What is it? Oh, no, you'll just start saying it. And then people will think I'm a terrible father because I taught you that word. And you just, I can't tell you. It's like, I promise I won't say it. I promise I won't say it. It's like, okay, I'm going to trust you. Do not ever call somebody a peanut brittle hat. And like, you're a peanut brittle hat. And... Like, I knew you would say it. I can't believe I told you. Don't ever say that to anybody. Don't tell mom I said that word to you. Mom, mom, dad said peanut brittle hat. And they, it just takes a few games of this to take the, the tension away from these words because they learn the words have extra power. They want to use words with extra power. And then they get in trouble for it. And it's so confusing. It's like, it's like if as soon as a child learns to run, they get yelled at for running. Well, that kind of does happen, right? <laughs> it's true. It's unfortunate. So it's like, I made this great advance. And instead of cheering, people are yelling at me for that. It's like, I learned this word and it has power. And, and you know, kids get punished for it. And they might even even know what it means. So they don't. They just saw, heard somebody say it and other people laughed or other people had a reaction. And so, oh, I'm going to say that. And now they're punished for it. That creates a big tension about it. And that tension might make them inhibited about talking in general. But more often, the tension is like, I got to say that word. I got to say that word and see what happens. And so this game, you know, I call it the poopy head game. So the poopy head game just releases that tension. Like, oh, you can call me Poopyhead, but you better not call me Raisin Bran. Oh, I can't believe I said that. And I've never seen a kid not not bite, you know. But a lot of these games that I throw out, it's like fishing. You know, you don't always catch a fish every time you throw in the line. This one, I've never seen it. That one's a reliable not, one. Not bite. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Thank you so much. This has been really wonderful to talk to you. I hope someday maybe you'll come back and talk about worry. We'll put all your books in the show notes with, with links. And that's also another wonderful book. If you could go back in time, this is the question I ask all my guests. If you could go back in time and give advice to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, I, I can tell you what immediately came to my mind is when my daughter would cry and what I said was, what's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? 
I needed her to tell me so I could fix it, so she could stop crying, so she could be happy, so that I could be a good parent and I could relax. Right? That was the whole sequence. I didn't realize it at the time. At the time, it was like, I need to know. And if I could go give myself advice, I would say, if she needed to tell you what was the matter, she would tell you. She's crying, which means what she needs to do right now is cry. You don't need to know what happened because this is not a fix-it situation. This is a cry and let me cry and be here with me with my feelings situation. And after that, maybe step two will be, I'll tell you what happened. But also, when she tells you, make sure to take it seriously. Because the second thing that I would do is I would say, what happened, what happened, what happened, what happened? And she said, oh, I wanted the green spoon and not the blue spoon. Then now I'm mad. Why am I mad? Because I got all panicky for nothing. Well, why is that her fault? It's like she didn't tell me to panic. That was all me. So the other advice would be, if she's upset about something, it's it's important to her. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be important to you. Beautiful. Thank you. Where can people find out more about you and what you do? Well, the best way to keep in touch is to send me an email at Larry at PlayfulParenting.com, and I'll put you on my newsletter list. Okay, great. I'm working on updating my website, but right now it's kind of out of date. But my newsletter is sort of the most up-to-date source of information. Okay, we'll put that. We'll put your address in the show notes, and I'm going to email you to get on your newsletter list. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. Yes, you bet. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.